So um, also, there will be something I want to address about dynamics that sort of came up, because we heard a lot of uh, the first two talks were about um, dynamics in the brain. That will be sorely missing in my talk. Um, I've been interested in neuromodulation by biogenic means uh, um, in preparing this talk um, for my whole career, I realize, and I've been a bit of a, a fanatic about it in various ways, even though we've worked in other areas in order to feed ourselves, it's been the thing that's occupied me. I'm going to start with a little question here, which is what's common amongst these things. This is um, now old hat. This is AlphaGo Lee, done by DeepMind. This is what beat the, at the time, the then world declared world champion in Go, um, using what are called deep Q learners. Using, uh, it's, a, it's a version of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is now in the computer science world, I know some of you must do it, exploded. I couldn't even begin to summarize its uses or its applications or whatever now. What I'm going to focus on is I'm going to dial back to the dark ages and say the sense in which in the dark ages it informed the way we thought about dopamine neurons, which is one source of neuromodulation throughout the brain. But the fact is, when you look at the algorithms embedded in all these heads here, um, uh, in sort of first order learning environments, environments where you're not learning super hard things, in fact, it looks like these things use the same sorts of algorithms, all these critters, including the artificial ones. Not only do they look like they use the same algorithms, biology discovered common structural motifs. Okay, and here's one. This is one of my kids, by the way, so I'll say. Uh, she's not the one on the upper left. Uh, this, is being f uh, this is being podcast, so she'll be able to see me talk about talking about her. And then she punishes me, of course, when I'm away. So, um, Okay, so this is a bee brain. This is a projection to the striatum of a, of a rodent. Uh, the red and green, uh, the red and blue um, indicate termination zones. They're not, they're not otherwise meaningful for that particular act. That's one axon. Um, this is a zebra finch that uh, learns birdsong. It has a version of the ventral tegmental area we heard about earlier. Um, and this is a human and some version of that. A little more squished would be a rhesus macaque. When you stick an electrode in these neurons here and you record from it, they modulate their spike rate according to a standard form of what's called model-free reinforcement learning. We can add on to that in a second, which I will. Um, in the case of this particular paper, this is a beautiful paper here. This isn't just simple reward conditioning experiments. This is performance errors by the bird. Okay, so birds, songbirds sit there, they listen to the male for a year, and then they start babbling after a while, and they have to correct that, and they learn, and they tune it up because they've laid down some sort of template. And that template is used in performance errors, and they induced an error in what the bird heard by shifting the phase of the song a bit at times, and so they could see that. So that's a for the bird, that's a higher order abstraction. That's a, you know, how does my song sound? That isn't conscious or anything, but I'm just saying that's a pretty sophisticated use. This is a, a neuron called VUMMX1. This is a paper by the late Martin Hammer. Again, say in the dark ages there. Um, these are actually, it's dendrites, and it produces a transmitter called oxytocin, which is a hydroxyl group away from dopamine. Plays the same sort of role. You can do conditioning on the B head by sticking an electrode in this showing a stimulus, firing the neuron instead of putting sucrose on the proboscis and antenna, and the animal will condition to that. You can come back and show the sensory stimulus, and it'll start doing nectar-getting behavior with its mandible and its, and, uh, its whatever you call the four limbs of a bee. Um, are there any bee people here? Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> but they're online, and then they troll me afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but these are dendrites, and it releases in the mushroom body. He even went on to do a cool experiment where he sh so he showed he could replace the presentation of the sucrose with firing of the neuron. Then he later went on and held the neuron isopotential and delivered the neurotransmitter in the right temporal order. Okay. And it doesn't backward condition. Just like Pavlov's dogs, when you ring the bell, feed the dog, ring the bell, and feed the dog, you ring the bell, it makes a prediction about when, the f when and how much of the food is coming. Uh, it conditions on that. If you reverse the time order of that, it won't condition. You have to really get them close together in time and strain and do all kinds of weird behavioral things to make it happen. Animals don't backward condition. Causality seems to, in our normal conscious sense of it, seems to be an important parameter for the biology of it. Okay. So those are, you know, single, small, single neuron or small cluster of neurons, about 50 to 80,000 per side in the 
human projecting to wide expanses of neural tissue. We do not know anything. Well, we know, and we'll come to that. We know a lot about how these neurons fire under various kinds of simple behavioral conditions, especially in rodents now, where in this sort of transgenic revolution that's gone on, we make tinker toy rodents, we can turn certain cells on at certain times and whatnot. So we know a lot about how this modulates electrically at the cell body, and we know that action potentials run out the branches, and then our knowledge falls off a cliff. We really have no really good, fast knowledge of what's going on at the other end of the problem, which is the release of neurotransmitter. Okay, and the neuron goes through a lot of effort to build complex release machinery in the synaptic terminals, about a micron across. Um, and we know a lot about that, but we do not know a lot about how information that we think is encoded here and models that we might build of it is translated into release at target structures and the degree to which it may or may not depend on um, local modulation. Okay, but if you were gonna move in from computational neuroscience to psychiatry, you might take one of two routes, at least in my mind. You might go the kind of psychosis route, the, the big ones, schizophrenia and depression and whatnot, and anything to do with these three systems, okay? So the disease burden worldwide of derangements in serotonin function, norepinephrine function, and dopamine function approaches like a half a billion people, okay? And that doesn't count China, okay? But it's, we think depression is grossly underreported in China, at least to the degree we can get those data, okay? Um, if you're profoundly depressed, you take one of a variety of things. A classic compound is SSR, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors which pro prolongs the impact of serotonin. If you have ADHD, you're put on drugs that block the reuptake of this and prolong it. We heard about that earlier. And if you lose your dopamine neurons, you have Parkinson's disease, and we know that every drug that is abused has a dramatic impact, both short-term and long-term, on the dopamine system. So, wow, we'd love to know something about that. Okay, so that's the disease burden argument. Um, I don't know if it's any good. <laughs> okay, so I got this from Wikipedia because I used to use one that I made and I just decided it really sucked and I would just reference Wikipedia. Uh, the classic, the, what's been building up over the last several decades about um, dopamine and serotonin is listed right here. So dopamine, if I were going to kind of broad stroke it, it's reinforcing, you, it tends to invigorate movement, it tends to increase and elevate mood, it's thought to be in some sense, you, something about it's associated with the euphoria that uh, attends drug taking, um, diseases that attack it, Parkinson's disease for example, for some unknown reason you start losing dopamine neurons, by the time you show up in front of a neurologist with symptoms, like I'm having trouble getting out of my chair, I'm developing tremors, I have cogwheel rigidity, whatnot, you've already lost 70 to 80 percent of the neurons. Okay, that's a cell biology problem that we don't really know much about. They're, they're candidate genes and they're transgenic mice built around these candidate genes and it's still, it's still very perplexing, okay. Serotonin, we know less about serotonin because the responses seem to be more heterogeneous. I would say these were not as heterogeneous, it depends on who you're listening to. If you look at the rodent literature literally in the last 10 years, it's exploded from cells that are doing reward prediction, ongoing reward prediction, to a whole bunch of cells that specialize on different sorts of rewards, consumatory behavior, even things that you would relate to. Um, in a human, you call it semantic learning, et cetera. Um, and there are interesting stories that are unfolding there. For serotonin, it's a little bit, the, the cell bodies are located in what are called the dorsal raphae nuclei. Again, project all through the cortical mantle and then strong projections down the spinal cord and into the cerebellum. Um, I would seriously doubt that these projections are all doing the same thing, okay? And I would seriously bet that there's a lot of local modulation going on, but we've had precious few examples where we're able to record the dynamics of these things, uh, much less at the same time. Um, and therefore, in, in my opinion, they've been called neuromodulators wrongly because once you, and I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about some new methods we've extended to record dynamics of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, pH, downstream oxidative products, and other stuff that I'm not going to report on. And uh, just for the record, I'm being 
Um, there are post, various kinds of posts. There's an archipelago of warnings on threats on my life if I talk about various postdocs work. So I, I, have to, I have to tell you what I'm allowed to say and try to keep my mouth shut otherwise, which is um, hopeless. Okay. Um, so the quote model that, as it were, was, was really a model of somebody else. And that's um, some combination of Richard Bellman in the 50s and Rich Sutton and Andy Bartow in the, um, in the 80s. Um, and it was the idea that, neur uh, sorry, that dopamine neurons in the brain stem were actually diffuse ascending systems. This was work I did with uh, Peter Diane and Terry Sanofsky in 1991. Um, uh, the idea was that they were doing some form of goal learning in the sort of reinforcement learning sense. I I like this, and I'll show you a little archaeology of the, the, the history of these algorithms. Um, the idea is to learn some target value function over the state of the animal, and it's defined as the expected value over the future discounted returns. Okay? Uh, when I was looking at this last night, I realized this is really um, boulderized notation. So there are two sources of uncertainty here. The first source is the transition from the state you're in now to the state you're being next. Okay? And then the second averaging, if you were going to do this right, is over the rewards that you would receive given that condition on that uh, transition. So I've considered this a broad stroke. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's a, that's a concrete goal. And when you do that, you can then say, oh, well, this enjoys a kind of recursion relation. And this is a nice little error term. And that was our interpretation for what these neurons ought to be doing. Because what it would mean is if you took a, a term like that and you look for a covariance rule at the level of synaptic contacts, then instead of storing correlations, which aren't very useful, you store predictions. Okay, so now when you go back and recall them, you have a system that can tumble out behavior and can tumble out one episode following another, et cetera. Um, there's almost no data that just, there's a ton of data that says that's a pretty good model for some of those neurons. Okay, and it obviously is a simple minded first step, it isn't the whole story. Okay, so that's a spike rate encoded temporal difference error in the, in the Sutton and Bartow sense. Um, I'll show you my version of it later. So this is the archaeology of it, okay? So for those who think that just came out of nowhere, or just came out of Sutton's head, uh, Rich Sutton was a psychologist slash computer scientist, I guess at uh, UMass Amherst at the time, doing a PhD with Andy Bartow. And it's his version of the rule that hit the mind of Chris Watkins, and which Chris Watkins was also working on dynamic programming at the time. So they're precursors to all this. The best being Arthur Samuels' checkers playing program in the 50s. Um, Arthur Samuels, I believe, coined the term machine learning and uh, was writing code until he was uh, like 88 or 95 or something like this. And he was sort of an amazing guy. At the same time, there are ideas that would be called in the style of Richard Bellman out in Marsteller and Bush, who in as early as 1951 looked at uh, learning in, in, the, in a Bellman-esque sense. It wasn't quite the same optimization idea. And then Richard Bellman's idea for uh, dynamic programming, which he named because he said it was an optimistic uh, name. Okay, so that was what was going on in the 50s. Um, Less went on in the 60s, and then Sutton came along and started trying to account for conditioning experiments in animals through the 80s. Um, Watkins came along and said, look, I can take Richard Bellman's ideas and combine them with Rich Sutton and make, some, make a value function learning system that instead of just learning over states, I learn values over state action pairs. And what he really did was, what he really did was say, I can show you how to do an incremental version of that. Okay. That's when I met him and Peter Diane because they were trying to prove convergence in various situations at the time. And um, boy, did I love that, this, this little sort of incremental crawling around. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is obvious. Any animal lives in this giant dimensional problem, and diffusing around in a giant dimensional space will get you absolutely nowhere. It's basically everything looks orthogonal in a bit if the dimensions are high enough. And so that, 
So there's something wrong with that, but there's also something simple with wandering around. So you imagine if you had a representation of the problem, you tossed it out and you reduced the dimensionality, then maybe an algorithm like that might be quite efficient. I would say that the modern RL explosion has shown that's not only true, it's really, really practical. You can build devices like that, okay? So I, I really think Watkins was a, um, um, this is my tongue in cheek uh, bit. Okay, and then what we did, me and Peter and Terry, was we marshaled this into cells and synapses and whatnot for about eight years, which is how long it took us to get past the physiologist to get the papers published. So I, actually down at the bottom, we published a paper with um, I think the leading neurophysiologist working on the problem at the time. Um, I'm sure he didn't like it, but the paper turned out okay. So that's a picture, okay? That's the old-timey picture. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to dive into the current rodent picture now because it's, it's interesting and complicated. I'm going to go to humans, OK? There are these cells, specialized cells, sitting in your brain stem. They receive a lot of information, and they chatter according to um, something that looks like a temporal difference reward prediction error. These chatters run out the axons and cause modulations, let's say, in a linear proportional sense, modulations of dopamine in the extracellular space. And any, and any correlational, any covariance rule here can absorb structure there and store it in some parameter. Now, you can imagine this to be presynaptic and postsynaptic activity, or you can imagine something smaller, even something in the extracellular space. You can be agnostic to that. OK. What we know a lot about is this. We know a lot about. The, we know a ton about how action potentials are generated and modulated, and we know a lot about the channels that support that and how spikes are made. So we know precious little about that. Well, how does it really release? What's it doing spontaneously? Does it talk to terminals nearby, et cetera? And, so we, and the reason we know less about that is we just hadn't had fast methods for measuring this. OK, so I spent, um, as, as by way of motivation, I spent like a a decade trying to talk um, physiologists into doing experiments that I wanted them to do. And shockingly, my experiments aren't at the top of their list. They're like down near 13 and 14. And so I sat around waiting for him to call and her to call, and nobody called. And so um, around 2004, I had done a little paper with Paul Phillips, who was training with a guy called Mark. Paul's at University of Washington now. Um, he's one of the leading voltammetry people, I think, certainly for behavioral pharmacology and voltammetry in, in the world now. Training with a guy called Mark Whiteman at UNC Chapel Hill, who's one of the pioneers of the method that I'm going to um, um, display for you and then cut down a little bit, chop it down to size a bit, extend it using machine learning methods and using a lot more data, like a million fold more data. And the idea is simple. You take a little bitty carbon fiber that is back up in this fused silica. Fused silica is flexible, for those who doesn't know what fused silica is. Um, tiny little flexible electrode. And back up in here, there's some silver paint, and it connects it to a platinum iridium wire. And um, if you put this at a potential and you hold it there, then different kinds of oxidizable species will give up electrons onto it. It's reflected as a current in the wire. If you change the potential, in a systematic way, then different oxidizable species, dopamine and serotonin are oxidizable species, will have sweet spots. And those sweet spots of voltage, one of them dominates over the other. Okay? And maybe you could sort of go whizzing by those voltages and repeat that over and over again brrr, and make an inference that, oh, I'm looking at dopamine of this concentration or that concentration. Okay? Everybody got that? And it's, it's a tiny. Electrode. This is uh, this is a rodent one, so this is maybe a centimeter long. The electrodes that we're going to use are going to take advantage of um, a neurosurgical platform called deep brain stimulating electrode implantation. So when you have Parkinson's disease and you take drugs to countermand it, you're taking uh, dopamine precursor drugs that get across the blood-brain barrier, get converted to dopamine, and sucked up into the terminals. Okay. So you come in in the morning, you're still and locked in. You take your meds and you're vacuuming your carpet pretty quickly. And about 35% of those patients, um, the drugs stop working, or they work oddly, or they develop extra what are called dyskinesias. A lot of the downstream motor problems in Parkinson's disease are caused by the 
long-term usage of L-dopamine drugs, dopamine precursor drugs. It, it drives people crazy, okay? They then become candidates for a procedure to put a little microwire in one of several spots in your brain, mainly something called the subthalamic nucleus, which is shockingly underneath the thalamus. Um, okay, so and the procedure is you drill a little burr hole under local anesthesia, you're sitting in a chair, and after um, very, very slow and careful sliding it in, they put it into a place. That was an opportunity for us to take the, the rodent electrode and adapt it for a human, which means make it, you know, 15 times longer. Um, deal with that in some way, and then make direct recordings in a conscious human being while they did, at first, simple reward-dependent task, and then later, um, more complex perception action task. Okay? Uh, started with work with Paul. We wrote a, I wrote a grant with him. Acquired Ken Kishida a few years later as a postdoc, and then Rosalind Morin, uh, who's now no longer at Virginia Tech. What, it's a loss for us. Um, who was also interested in neuromodulation, came on board to do the serotonin part of the project. Let me just give you, so this is a slice through the brain like this, and let me just show you how this would give us an opportunity. So here's a guide cannula that they use. They put a little cannula down, and then they use electrodes down the center of their cannula to record from various sites, and they have waypoints that they're listening for, electrophysiologically standard electrodes. Okay, so in the case of Parkinson's, they're typically going for the subthalamic nucleus here. And so they compute a range of trajectories that are acceptable to them prior to surgery. Um, if they're going to treat another condition called the central tremors, and this is an interesting condition for our purposes because the central tremors, although it has features of Parkinson's disease, uh, you haven't lost any dopamine neurons. Your dopamine responses are normal and you're actually not helped by L-dopa drugs, so it's exacerbated. Okay, so you can see um, if you're going for the thalamus, which is what they do for a central tremors, then you could, you could come along and record from the side of the putamen. And if you're going for the side of the lemon nucleus, you have a shot at the caudate. This is called the caudate. This is the putamen. This is a set of structures called the basal ganglia, and this is cut through them here. They're really oddly shaped, kind of stentorian horn-like nautilus-looking things to me, and they're... Um, they're, they're bizarrely shaped, so they look, um, they look odd on a coronal section like that. And that's an image through a subject that we use. The yellow here is the actual guide cannula. This area drawn in red is the caudate nucleus. It, they're heading here. Uh, this was actually a recording episode. The green trajectories are acceptable pre-computed surgical trajectories. Okay, so we're not poking new holes. We're going down, we're going down tracks that they're going to make. Anyway, okay, so um, you have to bear with me a second, okay? I have to tell you what's going on in voltammetry and how the inference step was done before and the changes we made to it. Okay, so the gig is illustrated here and I, I did it a little earlier. So this is time on the x-axis. This is applied voltage. This is a voltage clamp step. So when I say that it's a voltage right there, I know it's there and it's not moving unless I move. This is the command step here. So we go from negative 0.6 volts to 1.4 volts back down. And in the classic case in rodents, then there's a waiting period here of about 90 milliseconds. Okay, so it's 100 millisecond, 10 times a second duty cycle here. The, this is what it would look like. This is the current trace in the 10 milliseconds right here to different concentrations of dopamine put into a flow cell. So there's a little bitty in vitro setting in a laboratory, and they're changing the concentration in this flow cell, okay? And you can see just what you might imagine. It. They had some potential here, right about there. These are lined up. Different concentrations of dopamine cause bigger and bigger responses here. It oxidizes the dopamine. You're left over with an oxidized form of dopamine called uh, oquinone, you know. Are there any chemists here? Okay, good. Uh, it's called the oquinone form of dopamine, and if it doesn't diffuse too far, uh, diffusion at these scales um, is about a micron a millisecond. Okay, under about a millimeter, under about a thousand microns, diffusion would be about a micron per millisecond. That's about the distance across a synapse in a millisecond, okay? So as long as you whiz down here pretty quickly, you haven't lost all the oquinone form, and it reduces, but you can see it's not matched. It's not conservative. Some of it's diffused away. 
Okay, the, the people that pioneered this, Ralph Adams at um, either Kansas or Indiana, <laughs> it's like President Trump, um, <laughs> I can't remember, Kansas and Indiana are in the same spot in my head for some reason, sorry. Uh, I, I think he's no longer living, but they had this idea, we can do this and we can whiz by these oxidation potentials and we can get a characteristic signature here, maybe we make inference, inferences over how much uh, catecholamine is there. Um, and then that was picked up and applied in the nervous system by Mark Whiteman. And these guys are real pioneers for that. But they're also chemists. So one of the things that happens when they do this is they want to, that doesn't look pretty. It's all squiggly and stuff. And it has a capacitative transient he here. Okay? And so they do background subtraction. And what they mean is, I'm going to pick a condition that I'm going to call zero. It's, got, it's that squiggly line, and I'm going to linearly subtract that squiggly line across all the points. So so a, a statistics person would go, well, okay, well, why are those all equivalent? And it looks pretty nonlinear to begin with. Why are you linearly subtract? Okay, that's one. And the second thing is I'm really going to pay attention to this peak because I know that's the oxidation potential for dopamine. That's, those are both correct observations. What got missed was this. So what I'm showing you here, oops, let me show you the current again. Boom, okay. Here's the current trace induced by that. Bear with me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish this in a second. We're gonna go on to humans and neuromodulation. I realize this is kind of boring. Okay, that's the voltage forcing function. That's the induced current time series. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a time derivative of that, a finite time difference of that. Under the assumption that, you know, electrode one and electrode two may have some constant offset, I'm gonna get rid of that. That's all I'm gonna do. Oops, there we go. Okay, I cannot operate this thing. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the time derivative of the current time series for that 10 millisecond duty cycle. This is uh, for dopamine and this is for serotonin. These the, this is the color code for the concentrations and I'm not, nothing's happening here. I'm just showing you the response of the electrode to the different concentrations. Okay, this is a two and a half millisecond window. I could have gone over the whole thing and we would see st structure just like this. The main thing to notice is it looks like an airhead. Um, anybody eat airheads, candy, airheads? I have kids, they're these rainbow candies, okay? You can see the rainbow here. So if I said to you, um, make an inference over what concentration it is, um, all, I'd all you'd have to do is read the color off to me at any of those time points. So there's tons of information here, not even near the oxidation peak. This is the oxidation part of the curve. This would be the reduction part. This would look the same and this would invert over here. Okay, in fact, you can, um, at first, we had used a, as the inference step an elastic net that has a, a GLM plus this penalty piece. Um, and we thought that the par sparseness condition on the elastic net was important for pulling out the model. And the answer is, you can pull out a model from this doing 50 things. Um, in fact, you can train a recurrent neural net, which I'm not gonna show you, to do this that fails much more gently than the elastic net would fail when it fails, okay? Um, th that's just a implementation issue. Point is, I can, I can completely lose the oxidation peak and I can still pull off a model that predicts the concentration. So why did they miss that? Because what happened when they were recording this is the target function for them was reconstructing the time series, okay? So what got done in the past, which is wrong, which is the wrong problem, oops. Have I lost, oh. Which is the wrong problem, is you take this, you know there's a giant capacitative transient here, so stuff around here carries no information at all. You do principal components decomposition on it, you have these coefficients that pick this up, you use as your target function the reconstruction of the whole time series, most of which, not all of which carries the important information for you. When in fact, the important question is, pull a model out of here that predicts the concentration it's experiencing now. That's labeled data. Okay, so what you can do is you can go in and train up a model that's extremely sparsified using, what we did was we changed the inference step to uh, an elastic net. And when you do that, the elastic net, as you know, People have all heard of the elastic net in here, right? Okay, yeah, I think everybody uses it, okay. 
The penalty piece is a convex hull between an L1 um, penalty on the, uh, the, regression co the regression coefficient vector and an L2 penalty. And it almost always was finding the L1. It was almost always finding lasso or near lasso. Um, and that gave us, well, it gave me a couple of ideas about it. But we, the fact is, it doesn't really, we used to think that mattered. It just doesn't matter. Stuff pulls off. I can take 10% of the points at random, and I can run it through the same sort of workflow here, and I still get good models. OK. This is showing it. Um, uh, that doesn't mean I'm always convincing people. I mean, there's a, there's a small collective out there that still shoots at me. But this is doing the same method that was done before on, on one electrode. This, this is a carbon fiber electrode. We know principal components regression, elastic net regression. The thing about the elastic net is I can train it against things I don't want it to recognize. And I can identify subspaces in that 10 millisecond time series that I'm not interested in. I'm, you know, I can say, give me a model that predicts the dopamine that does not predict pH. Give me a model that predicts dopamine and serotonin that does not predict. And I can do this a priori. So you end up getting models that are really good. The, the true concentrations here are the light lines, and the, and the model's guess is the little blue dots. Here, PC regression. The green are the ones that are accepted by the preset criterion for the reconstruction of the variance in the time series. The reds are rejected. Um, it has a hard time generally, and it certainly has a hard time not recognizing pH. This is not to belabor other methods don't work. This is to say that the other methods weren't trained with modern rigor, and when you do train with modern rigor on half a million points and not 16, all of a sudden you get models that are fantastic. These are 100 milliseconds per estimate. Why is that important? That's important because in a human being, we can't put an electrode in and pull the electrode out and then recalibrate the electrode. We have to make it. It goes into sterilization, and we never touch it again. The first time it's opened up is in a sterile field. The first thing it touches is the human brain. So you have to be able to make hardcore models that generalize out of probe. All right. So what you're seeing here is the result of an experiment with, I think, um, something like three quarters of a million samples um, on 20 probes. So we bundled 20 probes together. We pushed the whole thing to an ensemble model. We pull that off. right? Then these are tested and cross-validated against concentrations that aren't in the training set, of course. And now here we are looking at a new probe and at concentrations that weren't used in the training set. Okay, So it's not perfect. It's not perfect. This is just serotonin. I, it's too confusing to show all of them. This was trained on a quartet. Okay, It's not perfect, but it does a pretty darn good job. This is known serotonin concentrations. This is predicted. Um, we are still in the growth phase of understanding how fast we can drive this. We're already routinely at 10 milliseconds, and we're at a little less than one millisecond in the lab. Um, but we yet to publish a paper sort of characterizing how fast the dynamics are going to track. I think that's important because spikes live down in that range. And there's a reason you use spikes to cause the release of these things. And you're not just making noise. And so I think the system is committed to that. So then you can use this. This is, again, in 100 milliseconds. These are just showing samples switched out every 15 seconds of the triple. I'm not showing pH. And then this is literally the first experiment we did with the triple. This was a few years ago now. And it separates norepinephrine from dopamine, which if you look at the, con if you look at the oxidation peaks, they're completely identical. Okay, so this is literally exploiting the data on the wings. Okay? There's not a plot like this in the literature yet. I'm trying to suck people into this. Okay. At the end of the talk, I'll talk about the exciting part of this, which is we've now implemented this on uh, depth electrodes used routinely during epilepsy monitoring in humans, so electrophysiological probes that we normally use. Okay? I'm not going to go through the validation part there. So let me turn to, um, to 320. So, okay. um, two types of tasks. Uh, one would be a standard reward learning task, simple in people. We started by doing, and the other is non-reward. Just be really clear here, OK? <laughs> so, I'm getting old, sorry. <laughs> um, all right. What we tried, for, so let me just, uh, so in the surgical suite, the people are in a, a kind of, a kind of a recliner chair, 
and they had a halo around their head and all screwed into their head, it takes locals, and then there's a whole bunch of apparatus attached to the halos so if, because they're off their meds and sometimes they're, sometimes they're tremoring and so the whole gear moves around. Um, and they're playing a game. We first started with a bandit problems, you know, two-arm bandit, three-arm bandit, four-arm bandit. Uh, it just, they, they, they couldn't do it. It was too tiring, it was boring, it, was, it, didn't, it didn't work. So we ended up on this kind of what we call a half market task. So here's the gig. You have, you're endowed with $100. Uh, this isn't the screen they see. The screen they see has a slider bar like this and it has your total amount and the differential amount from the last trial. Okay, so there's no guessing at where you are or how you just did in the last trial. There's no memory task in here and all. You set your bet, let's say 40% of the $40. Um, market on the next round fluctuates either up, in which case you get the relative fractional change in the price times your bet, or it fluctuates down, rinse and repeat, that's it. Okay, we've done this experiment in 500 people or so doing bold imaging. Um, in the um, surgical suite, we've done uh, 90, 97 people without incident. Um, that doesn't mean some of them don't quit. Some of them quit the task in the middle. They get tired, et cetera. But there have been no incidents, which is an issue. Could be an issue. Um, as soon as we dipped one of these models in and started looking at it, we started seeing things like this. So this is a moment when a, a gain was experienced. Bump. This is the estimated dopamine level. There's another gain. There's another gain, there's another loss on the top of the gain. And so we were happy with that. This is from a recording um, en route to the subthalamic nucleus here. I showed this patient B before. Um, when we, sorry. Um, there's structure at many time scales in these recordings. I'm going to show you two. The first one is looking at the market. There's no time constraints on the market. So let's look at this segment. Let me just draw your attention right here. Okay, so these are z-scored. The blue here is uh, z-scored market changes. It takes about two minutes. So this is like click. Click is about three seconds per choice. You see it here, it sits there. Click, market goes up. And this market goes up, and then it takes a four sigma dive from a peak, okay? And this is the dopamine estimate following at this longer kind of two minute time scale. So this is a, this is a slow rise in extracellular dopamine. On top of this are error terms that I'll show you in a minute, also encoded by dopamine, but differently. But the dopamine pulled out of this. So Paul Phillips said, well, I wonder how well the dopamine would do if it played the same game. So we made a little agent, and the agent used uh, the slope of the dopamine to decide to go all in or all out on their bet. And this is the agent's um, performance. This is the person over the course of the task, they lose 20% on the $100 endowment, and the dopamine model uh, at the time beat all the humans that had played it. Okay, why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because we're listening to what may be a value signal at a crucial synapse in the dopamine system and showing that if you could use that signal, you could actually play quite well. And that, so he has information there, that brain has information there, but for some reason it's not linking to behavior. Okay, that's the kind of thing that we would hope when we get up to 200, 300, 400 people, you can start describing these diseases as being dopamine over-release disease, dopamine duplication cell type disease, dopamine serotonin sharing disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of yeoman's work though, it's hard. Okay, so when we go to look for what you, we would call reward prediction errors, we, um, we sit and we collect up a running average and we look at fluctuations in the actual return to the estimate of the average return, so positive and negative, and we plot the distribution of reward prediction errors here, this is a histogram, and we look at, we look naively at the dopamine estimates of this, it's just the dopamine part of this experiment, there's a serotonin part too, positive RPEs and negative RPEs reward prediction error, here are lots of events across, um, I think this is from 17 people, we got nothing, I was not pleased with that. Um, if you sort on the bets, okay, in other words, if you bet way in, there's a positive fluctuation in the market and you've left very little on the table, okay. If you bet 10% and there's a positive fluctuation, you've left a lot on the table and people will parse as to what they like to listen to. Some people chase gains, other people chase 
non-losses. They don't want to. They don't want to feel the left out. It's a kind of a regret signal, if you will. Um, that's what this suggests to us. Other people have other interpretations. But this is the dopamine fluctuation on a positive reward prediction error and the dopamine fluctuation on a negative reward prediction error when you're all in, when there is no counterfactual, there is no regret piece. When you separate that into high bets, medium bets, and low bets here, there's time on this axis here. See, that's about 600 milliseconds. And this is dopamine fluctuation here. This is a positive prediction error. That's negative. They don't differentiate from one another here, and then they invert at low levels. Um, I can't show this here. I mean, I can't prove it here. I think that this is coming out of the serotonin terminals. I think this dopamine signal is coming out of serotonin neurons that are chattering positive when there's a negative occurrence and negative when there's a positive occurrence. And I think they probably have it loaded up because you've been overdosing them on dopamine and it's been taken up. We do know in rodent models that serotonin and dopamine will cross-load. Okay? So there's a picture of prediction error representations in the striatum. Um, in humans, th this is uh, work out of Michael Kahana's lab. Uh, 2009, Zegel et al., they played a similar sort of game. It was a, um, it's what we used to call war, high-low game. So there's unexpected gains and unexpected losses. The difference is this is recording in the dopamine neurons themselves with a single unit microelectrode. This is a smooth spike rate function here. So that's positive prediction errors, negative prediction errors. Unexpected gains, unexpected losses. Um, and this, I think, is real. This faster response to the unexpected loss in the spike train here, I think, is real. We now think we see that uh, at the faster rates. This is at 100 milliseconds. We're now at 10. And we, we see a clean separation between negative going responses and positive going response. That's in the cells. You would expect naively, if the cells were doing that, these are the, this is, we're in a target area, the caudate, the dorsal striatum. Um, this is what dopamine does. And then this is the work of Rosalind Morin and also working with Ken. This is what serotonin does. This is the first sort of experiment like that. You'll see we've got this refined now. So it's an opponent to dopamine for that simple setup. Okay, that's a pretty simple experiment. It's, it's like a conditioning experiment, instrumental, it's dependent on reward. And so I, we immediately went to, when we saw the fluctuations, actually the spontaneous fluctuations, we immediately went to, well, what happens when there's not an explicit incentive structure painted on top of the task? What happens when you do some canonical task that's been done in neurophysiology for a long time? So this is a task that literally has been done for 50 years in monkeys. You show a monkey some dots, there are different levels of contrast, and they're drifting one way or the other, and you ask the monkey which way are they going, okay? There are a lot of ways to do that. We didn't invent that. It's been used by many people, but they call it a visual discrimination task. One of the innovations that's happened, I think, with this task in the last couple of years is the way you typically make the task hard is you have the number of dots or their contrast or their coherency of movement be low, and then you ask, how good are they at making a decision? The problem is it conflates the evidence accumulation part because you make the, the sensory stimulus hard, then the decision is hard for you. You can't independently then make the decision hard. I, the innovation that Dan Bang did working with Steve Fleming was he said, well, I can build a psychometric function on the presentation of the dots. This is what I mean by coherency on the dots, sorry. You know, they're moving in some direction and we have a, this is high coherency, low uncertainty, and this is uh, 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 what does coherency mean? Coherency mean doing the same thing? Okay, so this would be, um, this is low uncertainty, low width, fat width, high uncertainty. So this is harder to decide which way the dots are going, all things being equal. So what happens is the dots come on, they're on for a thousand one count, they go off, fiducial line comes up, and you're just supposed to say, was it clockwise or counterclockwise to that? I and mean, it's not listed as CCW or CW, it's just colors. Was it in the blue or the orange? Okay. Easy is this. The dots, here's the fiducial thing. The dots tended to be orthogonal to it. And hard is when they tend to be collinear. So what it lets you do is we build a psychometric function over this. And we go to your high and low for you. And we match that to somebody else. Same thing here. High and low for you. And so we turn this sort of continuous task into a two-by-two two design. And we offer you high or low 
on the evidence accumulation part and easy, hard on the decision part. I thought that was an innovation. I noticed it. I called him up and I said, I'd really like to see whether dopamine and serotonin encode this. So we did the following. We've done five people. We've actually done six people. We threw one out because they were on antipsychotics. We didn't know it. Um, it's a mix of central tremors and Parkinson's disease. The, the game that we play is we go down to Wake Forest. This is done at Wake Forest. Um, we do this uh, stimulus calibration for each subject, get them used to the task, and figure out what their high and low is for the evidence accumulation and decision part. Um, do it again right before the task, and then during surgery, we repeat that. So we now have surgery is a special setting. We thought, you know, maybe you're weird in surgery. So when you compare the behavior during surgery to the behavior pre-surgery, this is looking at uh, low distance, high distance. This is the decision part. Um, and this is accuracy as a function of that. And this is their subjective confidence rating on it, which is another part of the experiment we're not ready to publish yet. Um, this gray bar here is we did a separate cohort of 51 people, and what you're seeing is here's where people that don't have Parkinson's disease or central tremors fall, just to show you where the sick people are falling, okay? So there's the behavior. It tracks what we expected it to track. Oops. Okay, in the caudate, for subjects one, two, three here, um, for low coherence versus high coherence, serotonin clearly tracked uncertainty. So when uncertainty was high, it went high, and when uncertainty was low, it went low. Okay. There was some hint that at the trend level, dopamine did the opposite of that. Uh, we're not willing to say that yet. We're not, we, we think that, that the fluctuation in the dopamine response for that might be related to their disease state. Time will tell. We don't know. But this is definitely true. And there's the group average right here. These bars are simple t-test asking whether this is different than zero for either the high coherence or low coherence condition. Why is that interesting? Well, that's not a reward or anything. And those are quick fluctuations, 600 millisecond fluctuations in serotonin at the level of the caudate, not having anything to do with reward. OK, so that's new. There's no animal where we've seen that yet. Um, and I, don't, I think it's probably because it's doing lots of functions at lots of frequency bands that we just haven't been able to look at. Um, and here's a cool response. So this is in the putamen. And in this subject, I'm, we're pl I'm plotting the pooled data here for dopamine and then for serotonin. And that's a 95% confidence interval. The pink guy is the histogram of a reaction times. OK, so the dots come on here. They go off here, and they're free to answer us what are you going to do? And this is just showing the distribution of the reaction times. So we immediately thought, and this is showing, this is a one-tailed t-test, are you different than zero? Um, we immediately thought maybe dopamine, serotonin dynamics were encoding the reaction times. Uh, oops, sorry. Keep. Oh, I'm two seconds over. OK. So what you can do is you can take, instead of aligning to the onset of the dots, you can align to the motion. OK, let me draw your attention right here. OK, so this is now aligned to when I actually made my movement. OK, and I've separated out the dynamic estimates of the serotonin level according to whether it was slow, medium, or fast. And what I mean is I just cut this into tersiles. OK, and you can see they all dip down right before the choice. So whenever they do that, um, the choice comes right after the serotonin fluctuation. This is considered a motor part of the striatum in the kind of uh, narrative genre of neurology. Um, and now we can back up to here. So instead of aligning to the choice, you can align to the onset of the dots here. And you can see, you may say it fast, medium, and slow. OK? That's certain. It dips down, and then you move. OK? There's likewise interesting dynamics in the dopamine. Here it is aligned to the choice. So this is the other way around. This is slow, medium, and fast, um, pushing up right at the end. You can make of that what you want. I think the take-home point is, this is, these are beautiful data, really. I mean, it's amazing, is that here are these modulators fluctuating together in some sort of joint dynamic, the first time we'd be able to look at it. And now all of a sudden, it's opened up to wow, they're coding lots of things. Wouldn't it be great if we could record this all over the brain? 
And so that's our future plan. Uh, so this is just showing that we can take the same approach. This is a depth electrode used to monitor for epilepsy. Um, this is a macro contact, which is what the neurologists use. And these are micro contacts used for research. And so you can train models that compare a micro contact to a macro contact for doing the same sort of thing. This is just showing dopamine, serotonin, and a downstream oxidative metabolite of serotonin. Um, we've, um, these electrodes go throughout your brain. They're typically in a region called the anterior cingulate, the orbital frontal cortex, and the temporal lobe and hippocampus. And so we're now on the edge of being able to record these fast transmitter dynamics and these structures concurrently. So um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.